Is he in the house with you? Uh -huh. Does he have any weapons? Yes. What does he have? Is it a gun? Uh-uh. A knife? Yeah. Okay. Is he in the very same room with yeah. you? Over here, trying to get up there. Is it possible for you to pretend like I'm someone else and stay on the phone with me? Yeah, okay. Okay? So how are things going? Oh, pretty good. Okay. I don't know. You know, this house that I was thinking of um, showing you tomorrow, I don't know if it's right. And I turned around and he's standing behind me with a knife. I just want, I wanted him to kill me. I was so tired of living this cat and mouse game. Kathleen Gallagher was stalked for over eight years by a guy she met in high school. And they were in the same class, but she didn't really know him. Um, it was when she actually came home to visit her family during her junior year in college that this horrific ordeal began. Her former classmate, armed with a knife, breaks into Kathleen's house and waits for her to arrive home. He takes her hostage, but somehow during this horrific ordeal, she figures out a way to tip off the cops who swoop in and apprehend her attacker. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Deptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we bring you Kathleen Gallagher, who narrowly escaped an attempted kidnapping by her stalker. Kathleen Gallagher, aka The Safety Chick, is a nationally recognized personal safety expert whose mission is to inspire, educate, and motivate people to make smart personal safety choices. And she teaches people how to be alert so they can protect themselves when dealing with a stalker. Let's hear from Kathleen as she tells us how the stalking began. It was a guy that I had gone to high school with, but... Um, you know, we were on the track team. He was an acquaintance, but no more than high in the hallway. I had no relationship with him. Um, but because it was a small high school and, you know, you, I, I knew who he was. Right. Right. And so he really never bothered me in high school, you know, never did anything. And it wasn't until my junior year at UCLA, um, it was I was home for Thanksgiving and I got a strange phone call and I recognized his voice because he had a speech impediment. And he was asking me these weird questions. He was saying his name was something other than it was. And then he just kind of hung up. And it stuck with me like, well, that was kind of weird. And then the next day, I was driving down to see a friend um, at the local college there. And I looked next to me and he was driving next to me in a, in a truck. And, it, huh. and that startled me, obviously. And as he pulled away, he had a gun rack with a gun hanging in his back. And I always laugh when I speak all over the country. I, you know, when I'm in Texas, I'm like, well, that might not seem strange to you. Right. I mean, I grew up in a in tiny the, town in Iowa. That yeah, was pretty normal. Pretty normal. I mean, but they, in the, I'm sorry, in the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. Right. Like, not, not, about, not so normal. Not so much. It's the gut instinct thing. It's the something is not right here. And for sure, I was tapping into that. And so later that night, um, this all happened in one day out of the blue. Um, later that night, my friend, who was a guy, a bigger guy, he drove me home and dropped me off. My parents were um, out to dinner. And I got out of the car first, and my stalker came out of the bushes and, like, confronted me. And I froze, and, and my big friend came and kind of stood between us, and he said, what are you doing here? When he confronted, like, what do you mean confronted you? Did he, he say anything? No. He no, he just like came up on me and just kind of looked at me, and that's and that's the other that's thing the that's it, that that is real. Everybody says, "How do you how do you know wh what a bad guy looks like?" Or how do you feel? <laughs> it's it's in their eyes, it's their aura that they're giving off, and like you know, the lights are on, but no one's home. He looked through me, like right through me. It wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol. It was just something is not right here. And so then, you know, my friend Brian jumped in and said, hey, what are you doing here? And he just kind of looked at him and said, uh, how old are you? <laughs> and Brian's like, uh, probably the same age as you. And he just, you know, whatever. And he ran back and got in his truck and took off. So we ran into the house and um, um, my college roommate was spending the night there as well. And so the phone rang and she picked up the phone and it was my stalker. And he said, tell the big guy I'm going to kill him. And she's like, what? He says, I have 180 rounds of ammunition and I'm going to blow them away. And she said, well, listen, you know, Kathleen's going back down to UCLA tomorrow. Can't you? And he goes, oh, yeah, well, we still have tonight. She's not going to make it back down there. Wow. Oh, my God. So we called the police and we had a vehicle description. And the police came and sat across the street 
And sure enough, he came driving back by and they did this big police chase across the city. They pulled him over. Uh, there was 180 rounds of ammunition, a semi-automatic weapon, and a loaded clip under his seat. So they threw him in jail for a psych hold, because um, remember, you know, and the gun was, uh, the guns were legal, but they just kept him for the, that time, and that was that. So that was in November, okay? That February, I went back home to, um, and by the way, he was put, I, as I told you, he was put on a psych hold, and then um, I think he, God, it's, there were so many, I'm, I think he was an outpatient at a hospital for a little bit, you know, that like he was mandated to, to go to a little counseling kind of thing. February, so November, November, December, January, February, three months later. So you didn't hear from him in those three nope, months? Nope, didn't hear from him. Okay. And I was back at school and whatever. Um, February, I had come back up to visit my friends and had gone to a basketball ca- game. And I came home and police had surrounded my house. And I went sprinting in to find out that he had showed up at the door asking for me. And my father answered the door and, you know, obviously was concerned because he's not supposed to be anywhere around me. And when he turned and walked away, my father saw that he had a gun in his uh, belt in his back. And then he went and sat across the street in the car, in his car. So they called the police. I got home and the police were waiting there and they said, we've tapped your phones. I mean, it was like out of a movie. I'm serious. The, 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 these things really happen. So they had tapped the phone and they said, he's going to call. And uh, we think. So if he calls, keep him on the phone for as long as you can. And so I'm like, okay. So the phone did ring and it was him. And he was saying things like, why is your father, why does your father hate me? Why did he call the police on me? This, that, and the other. I'm like, well, maybe it was the semi-automatic weapon you brought around <laughs> last time. I don't know. Maybe. No, but I mean, you don't. And that's the other thing. Seriously. Do not get into a conversation with your stalker thinking that you're going to change their mind. They're delusional. They hear whatever they want to hear, whether it's F you, buddy, F you, buddy, I hate you. They'd hear, oh, she really likes me. Look at all the you know attention she's giving me. So that is a no-go. The only reason that I was talking to him is because I was trying to stay on the line so the police could track it's him, like, look right? At him. So that's number one. Do not communicate with your stalker. Um, anyway, they were able to tag him and again they did the chase throughout the city they pulled him over he again had the 180 rounds of ammunition and semi-automatic weapon knives handcuffs only this time he had a police scanner and he had the crystals that monitor the different police frequencies for every county from la back up to the bay san San mateo so this time when he was arrested a detective interviewed him the next morning that detective Ron Brooks showed up at my house and sat my parents and I down in the living room and said, listen, we, we really have a problem here. In the three months that I didn't hear from him, he drove down to UCLA, which is about a five, six hour drive, mm-hmm. waited on the campus, didn't see me, drove back up to my parents' house, broke into their house, went through their address book, got my address, drove back down to UCLA, waited for me, didn't see me, and then called and my roommate answered and said that I had gone home for the weekend. So he flipped it around and went home. So um, he said that he wanted to kidnap me and take me up to the Trinity Mountains and, you know, whatever. So at that point, Detective Brooks said, you need to get a restraining order. So that's when I I got the first restraining order. Now remember, no, no stalking, no, this is all just harassment, misdemeanor harassment. There were uh, six arrests or eight arrests leading up to this last event. And each one, I mean, one right here in Marina Del Rey where I jumped over a wall to get away from him and I punctured my calf on a wrought iron, wrought iron planter hook and he went off and I was on crutches. And so, you know, every, every, by the grace of God, I was narrowly escaping. So this guy was so obsessed with Kathleen, his mission to kidnap her, but never said a word to her in high school. I mean, a stalker can really just be anyone. Like each individual stalker may have their own personal patterns of stalking. There's really no way to know what they're gonna do next or when they're gonna escalate to the next level. So Kathleen had to constantly keep her guard up. She knew he wouldn't stop coming for her, but she didn't know when or how he would approach her. And the problem was at the time, there really weren't any stalking laws in the books. 
so there was no one she could turn to for help. I mean, the cops granted her one restraining order after another, but it never stopped him for long. Exactly. She had to take back control of her life and fought to put an end to this. So what would happen is he would be arrested for violation and restraining order, okay, which is a misdemeanor, and then he would serve like 60 days in jail and then three years probation. So he was always good for those three years of probation. Oh. And then as soon as the probation was up, it, it was the pattern. So, um, you know, two were in Northern California. One was in Marina Del Rey. And now I'm back up living um, in the Bay Area and I had gotten married. And um, <laughs> my ex-husband uh, played for the Mi Miami Dolphins. And so, but we were in the Bay Area and it was mm, January, just before. And we ordered a Domino's pizza. And I felt really safe because the house was in his name. I wasn't, you know, anywhere. And I answered, I answered the door. It was the Domino's pizza delivery guy. Wow. And I still don't know if that was coincidence or not. I still don't know. But the bottom line is. I'm going to assume it was not coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> that that is know. out of a movie. That is literally, I think right? I saw an Ashley Judd movie with the same plot. Line. I think someone's stealing my ideas <laughs> or my, my life. <laughs> anyway, um, so it blew everything because now he knew where I lived, right? So because I'd been doing this for so long and working hand in hand with the police, I then it became my own case manager. I ran to the Menlo Park Police Department, showed them a restraining order, told him the whole story, gave him his picture. They came over. They were great. I mean, honestly. We, but again, I was very, you know, unlike, you know, I've been doing this for so long, right, that I was very comfortable in my role. And so the police worked with me very well because I was very proactive. Right, and I'm and, sure you knew articulate. you had everything put yes, together. Exactly. You knew exactly what to say to them. Exactly. So, you know, a lot of victims don't know how to do that and that gets them in the police not to work as well with them. And that's the the why I, again, safetychick.com, we'll talk about <laughs> it after, but people that need help, that's what I do. I help them manage their case. Um, anyway, because the police are there, there are resources, they do want to help, but they can only do so much. You know, you right. have to be proactive as well. So after the Domino's pizza thing, we kept seeing him and he, he so he got picked up for violation of restraining order uh, in January of 90. Put away for um, 60, two, two months, I think. And we got married and we had just come back from our honeymoon and I got a courtesy call from Menlo Park PD saying, we just want to let you know he's been released from jail, just heightened sense of awareness, which is wonderful, which is another thing that I'm still trying to get past our parole conditions um, for stalkers. So he had been released from jail and my um, ex-husband had to go back to Miami for sp spring ball, spring training. And I got a call the next day from my stalker's probation officer. Because, see, I also would find out who the probation officer was and call and introduce myself. That's awesome. To say, because it's a violation of their rights to give out anything, but I wanted him to know, look, here's who I am, here's where I live, here's what I'm afraid of. I want to know, is he doing, you know, is he, what's his mental state? But he, he wouldn't, couldn't tell me any of that. But I just wanted him to know that I'm right here and I'm concerned. So I get a call from him saying, uh, that he didn't show that my stalker did not show up for his probation meeting and that he'd been acting despondent and that I should really be on the lookout because he felt he was coming back after me. I mean, at this point, her stalker is escalating and he's deviating from like previous patterns. So his normal pattern was to lay low during probation and then creep up as soon as his probation was over. But now, after all these years, he changes up his routine. Right, and the scariest thing is that now her stalker's missing, so no one knows when he's gonna surface or where, or even what he's capable of doing when he does. And I have to tell you, uh, now we're going on, what, nine, 10 years? Oh. And I, my parents lived 10 minutes from me, and at that time I was kind of dabbling in real estate, and I just said, come and get me. I just want, I wanted him to kill me. I was so tired of living this cat and mouse game that I'm like, screw it. I'm not going to leave my house. You know, I could have gone, you know, the smart thing to do, <laughs> do not listen to me, anybody out there. I was an idiot. My point is, 
the smart thing to do would be to go to my parents' house or go to safety and not stay there by myself, right? That's, it's obvious. But I'm just telling you, my psyche was, I'm done. And so uh, I remember going over to my girlfriend's house that I'd gone to kindergarten with saying that very thing. And she's just, don't worry. Because for four days, he was missing. And like in the middle of the night, I would slide out of bed and crawl through the house on my stomach and like freeze thinking that he was out there. In the morning, I would open the door and kind of tense up thinking a bullet was going to come. And then I had a partial on his license plate and I would comb the neighborhood like looking for his car before I went home. I mean, that's how I was living. You had to though. Yeah. But I'm saying the quality of life was, yeah, you know, living in fear is, is debilitating. So, um, about four or five days in, I was, uh, came home, um, and was listening to my answering machine and I turned around and he's standing behind me with a knife, just walked right up. And do you know how he got in side door? He'd broken in and I kept on having, um, false alarms and the police kept coming over, but they weren't, he was, he was messing with it, but he just hadn't been caught yet. So he, yeah, he broke in while I was gone. And, um, so the first words out of my mouth were, sit down, I've been expecting you, we need to talk. Because I'd played it over and over in my head for years. And so he immediately, and you know, I knew the guy in high school, right? I felt like I knew him because he kept showing up. So he became really agitated, said, listen, you know, you better tell me if um, someone's here. No, no one's here, you know? And again, I go back to the conversation with him was not to talk him out of whatever he was going to do. There was no talking to anybody. It was just talking in circles, trying to buy myself time. Your intuitive nature, spirit, your spirit guide, God, whoever takes over and has, I don't know why I said the things I said. So let me, so all of a sudden the phone rings and I said, you know, I better answer that because everybody knows you're missing. And he stood there with a knife, but he let me answer it. And it was my mom. And I don't know about your mothers, but my mom could just chat and chat. She she doesn't listen. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I've got one of those. Oh, my God. So she would ask me a question, and I would answer something completely different, hoping that she would catch on. And, oh, no, it took her a couple times. (laughs) Nance. (laughs) But she did finally catch on, (laughs) which is the key. And um, What kind of things were you saying? So she said – so I would – What I finally ended up saying, she would ask me a question. I said, yeah, it is really hot. And she kind of paused. She said, is everything okay? And I said, no. And then she knew. And then she said, is there a And I said, yep. Okay, got to go. Because I didn't want him to hear. But at least I knew that someone knew. And the police were only a few blocks away. So I felt better about that. So, you know, we go on back and forth about God knows what. And um, the phone rang again. And it was police dispatch. It was a a woman police officer. And she said, um, where is he standing? Whatever. But I started talking to her like she was a client, a real estate client. And I was trying to sell her a house on Cloud Avenue. Is he in the house with you? Uh Does he have any weapons? Yes. What does he have? Is it a gun? Uh Uh-uh. A knife? Yes. Okay. Is he in the very same room with you? We're here trying to get up there. Is it possible for you to pretend like I'm someone else and stay on the phone with me? Yeah, okay. Okay? So how are things going? Oh, pretty good. I don't know. You know, this house that I was thinking of um, showing you tomorrow, I don't know if it's right. This is what I'm telling you. When you hear, you know, I did um, before, before Megan Kelly got the boot, I did her show. (laughs) And we did a whole show on stalking. And um, they found my 911 call and played it. Um, on the show and I hadn't heard it in a while but what I will say is that when you hear that when I hear that voice it does not sound like me there was a guiding spirit that day guiding me so uh, she was able to get a lot of information out of me where is he standing does he have a weapon you know this that and the other and she said well the police are almost there but you need to get outside because we don't want like a hostage okay (laughs) so, <laughs> bye. But hey, just go okay. outside and wait for us. <laughs> really? So, so I'm, you know, I'm standing there. I'm thinking they're not there yet. So I got to buy myself some. So, what's your favorite movie? I mean, I don't know what you say. You know, I was, but I. So I felt like it had been enough time. It was probably like forty-five seconds, right? But so he um, took me out into the garage, 
Was that his idea? Yeah. Okay. He said, okay, come on, we're going. And he wanted to drive my car. And my car was parked in the driveway. And he had rope laid out and his jacket. And I'm like, I had no, how long has this guy been in my house, right? So he uh, tied my hands up and he said, now don't run and don't freak out. And he pulled out a gun. And at that point, that, changes things, that, that was a game changer. Uh, it was just an out of body experience. You just kind of go into another zone. Um, but he put the gun um, again behind his back in his belt and put his leather jacket over my arms so that no one could see that my hands were tied. And we went out the side garage door and we got um, into the driveway and I looked around and there was no one. And he was putting the keys in the car door and I'm kind of like backing out of the line of fire. And a police officer came from the end of the driveway and pulled out his gun and said, freeze or I'll blow your effing head off. And I was like, oh my God, they really say that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that might that's a movie. That, that's, <laughs> that's your movie. That's there it is. Right there. That's it. Yeah. And so um, he didn't freeze, but he pulled out the gun and, and put it at his chest so the cop didn't shoot him. And then from everywhere, law enforcement came, you know, and all of a sudden there's all these guns pointed at our house. And I noticed over in the corner a tall officer by the name of Lance, I'll never forget him, waving to me to run to him. So I had to turn my back and run. Good news is I ran the 100 meters and um, I believe I ran the fastest 40 meters of my life, <laughs> hurdled the picket fence with my hands tied and landed into the arms of the waiting detective. So I wow. escaped unharmed. Amazing. He kept them at bay on my front porch for the next 11 hours threatening to kill yeah. himself. Finally, SWAT was able to come up behind him and tackle him and you know he went off. He went off to prison for eight years, 10 months for attempted kidnapping because by law, he didn't take me enough feet. It's a miracle she escaped unharmed. I mean, it's total bullshit though that because he didn't kidnap her far enough away from her house, he only got attempted kidnapping rather than like actual kidnapping. Unbelievable. And you know, we know that he was sentenced to eight years, 10 months in prison, but he copped a plea deal and served only four before he's released back into the public. I mean, I think this is really why we need to hear stories like this. I mean, the laws have changed since then, but they're still not good enough to keep stalking victims really safe from these predators. Agreed. But Kathleen's ordeal isn't over yet. Let's find out what happened when he was released from prison after serving just four years. He got out of um, four prison years. four years and uh, was on parole in Sacramento and had strict parole conditions, much like a sex offender. Right. And the thing that bothers me about all that is that unlike a pedophile or a murderer with a stalker, you know who their victim is. You know who they're coming after. So while they're on parole, I believe that we have a duty to protect that victim still. Of and to <laughs> tell them where the stalker is and all that. Well, as it stands right now, that's a violation of the stalker's um, rights, even when they're on parole. See, I feel like if you're still on parole, there needs to be some stricter legislation, which we can talk about on another show. But so... There were two parole officers that were assigned to him, and they had pagers. Yes, do you remember what those were? Oh, yeah. Those little square things? <laughs> and he was um, staying in a halfway house, and part of the condition was if you went a certain number of enough feet, uh, with, you had to call your parole officer within a certain amount of time to let them know. Well, they were covering him 24-7, and there was a beef that they weren't getting overtime. So they went into their um, parole supervisor, Hank Peralta is his name. Um, what was his name again? Hank <laughs> Peralta. Are you still out there, Hank? <laughs> anyway, um, he made the decision, look, until we sort out this payroll thing, just turn off your pagers. So my stalker got wind of this somehow and cut off his bracelet and took off. Now at the time, uh, it was Super Bowl. Uh, we weren't in it. We never were in it, for God's sakes. But it was in Miami. And uh, 
um, <laughs> I was doing sports then, and so I was covering like parties and stuff and mm -hmm. different things. And so at the time, uh, my first son was now like two. We're asleep, 11, you know, midnight, and I get this call from the female probation officer saying, um, or parole, I'm sorry, parole officer, saying, we have a little bit of bad news. Your stalker's missing. Again. Again. And so I'm like, what, you know, so I had to hire private security um, to go in because he had a key to me. He, my parent, where's the first place he's gonna go? My parents' house, right? So I had to secure them. I had to, you know, $50,000 later, had to get security, get them out. Um, and I called Ed Royce and just said, look, I don't know what to do because what happens when violent felons jump parole? Anybody? If they, they fuck they, up. They commit a crime. Holy class. Yeah. Mm. The next crime they do. Well, that wasn't, I didn't feel comfortable with that scenario. <laughs> so um, I uh, called Ed Royce saying, you know, this is a situation. So he called Dan Lundgren, who at the time was our attorney general, and said, look, you can't let our poster child for stalking get murdered. We got to do something. Dan Lundgren got the violence suppression unit out of the Department of Justice is, is a group. They're kind of under the DEA, but was a group that would hunt felons. And so he, he you know, directed this group. And the head of this group turns out was, do you remember when I told you the first detective, Ron Brooks, mm -hmm. that was the Redwood City Police Department? He's now been, he's now under the head of the Violence Suppression Unit, DOJ, and now he's on this case. And he's like, and, and I'm talking, wait, that was 83 to 90, mid 90s. Wow. And he's like, how do I know that name? <laughs> and also he's like, oh my God. So. He was a godsend. He was a godsend because he was on this thing. And so he was going and interviewing everybody. And he went and interviewed his sister and heard that she'd given him money and he was on his way to Florida. Oh, perfect. To, to see their, their uncle. I'm uh -huh. like, okay. So um, once we got that information, we were taken into, custody, into um, protective custody with Fort Lauderdale SWAT. So we lived... Um, you know, I had two guys with me. One guy would go to preschool with my son Turner, just like kindergarten cop. And then my ex-husband, he was on his own because he had NFL security. So we're sure. like, you're on your own. Anyway, so, and then at night, they would come and we would leave in an unmarked car and go stay in a hotel with an armed guard. And four guys would come in and secure the home. And we lived like that for eight days. And the best part about that, the Fort Lauderdale SWAT was awesome, first of all. I love those guys. And um, the guy, one of the guys that had the overnight shift was kind of a clean freak. So I'd come home and my laundry would be done, my floor would be mopped. I'm like, I love this guy. That's awesome. So, you know, there's always little perks. Um, anyway, he was arrested um, eight days later. They tagged his bank account and he was arrested in Reno gambling, trying to get more money to get. So he went back for another year. Willie Brown at the time, you know, changed the, the laws. And so when you break parole, you just go back for a year. Hmm. And then he broke again and went back for another year. So, and then now he's um, free and living his life. So he breaks parole, goes back for a year, breaks parole, goes back for a year. And now he's just free and living his life. But Kathleen is now working diligently to not only change the laws, but help other victims protect themselves by showing they can fight back and not become another statistic. Right. And she's also the founder and CEO of Safety Chick Enterprises. She's become a public speaker. She provides personal safety programs for businesses, private consulting for stalking victims. She has her own podcast and she's t written two really great books that everyone out there should read. I've read them. They have opened my eyes to things for sure. Um, and they're both available on Amazon or her website, which is safetychick.com. That's S-A-F-E-T-Y-C-H-I-C-K.com. Agreed. Kathleen has some amazing tips on how everyone can keep themselves safe. My whole philosophy is you need to, first of all, caring about your personal safety is the greatest gift that you can give yourself. This is a lifestyle choice. This is, you know, this isn't about being paranoid. It's about you know, living positive and empowered. And so the other thing is all of us, 
You need to learn how to build a perimeter of safety around you virtually and physically. Personal information is personal. You decide who gets to have it. People just freely put their, you know, and by the way, once it's out there, you can't put toothpaste back in the tube. You know, every situation is different. Every interaction is different. And personal safety is personal. It's what makes you feel comfortable. So listening to your intuitive body signals is key and paramount in these types of things. As a woman or a man, I know I know just as many men that have been stalked, right? Agreed. So it's just we live in a very obsessive, self-absorbed time with no boundaries because of social media. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have three grown boys and – and then again, I speak all over the country to adolescent girls and I, you know, trying to give them street smarts before they learn it <laughs> the hard way. And, you know, the communication skills and tools and emotional intelligence of this whole group that grew up with social media is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why we're seeing so much more of this. They don't have coping skills. They don't, you know, I I teach them, you know, the consent and all this. I mean, you guys put down your phone, you know, you know, and like, hey, I'm single. You know, I I get the the texting thing. I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. First of all, do you know how old I am? But anyway, no, but it's, it's the, it's that anybody can write the flirtatious stuff over text. Say it to my face. Mm -hmm. Call me on the phone. Changes everything. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. And so we're, you know, I can go on and on down this, you know, rabbit hole right. of things that are happening that are real, that, you know, everybody wants to know, how do we stop sexual assault? How do we stop stalking? You know, the, the thing is, is knowledge is power. Empowerment is power. Making smart personal safety choices, recognizing, you know, gaining emotional intelligence. And, you know, we, we've, we've got a long way to go. Leaving a restaurant late at night, and my thing is, is if you're a true safety chick, you're not leaving a restaurant by yourself at night unless you have valet sitting right there, and you're you're not walking down the street. It's just not a smart personal safety choice, you right. know. But um, so you feel that like chill down your spine. You feel like someone is behind you, right? It's that is that intuitive. We've we've all felt it, and it's funny because we as women are taught to you know, be polite. So you don't want to like turn around, and, you know. And so what I say, going back to personal safety is personal, use like, look at the windows. I can see looking straight ahead, you know, blocks behind me. So you use mirror windows and reflections around you to see. In fact, my boys, I go back to that. They still think I have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> the world of stalking. I, you know, get tons of emails every week from people that need help or want help. And I vet them um, because it, the other thing is, is I now run a business, right? As a consultant that, that can help you. And so you learn really quick. And I, I'm, I'm also a big fan of making safety and personal safety affordable because I live in the world of Hollywood security, right? And, and the, the men that I work with, charge an exorbitant amount of money, rightly so. I mean, they're all very talented people. But, um, you know, I feel that there's a real place for somebody like me that um, can help facilitate if you really do need the big guns or if you can do this on your own. I mean, that's where my passion lies, right? And then also, um, over the years, I developed uh, personal... I'm a big fan of blending women's accessories and personal safety products. I am in the middle of creating a safety wearable because there's a huge... Um, gap in the marketplace for a safety wear, a panic alarm, a panic button that uh, opens an app on your phone because crime happens in a split second, Uh, you know, and people always say, oh, do you carry a gun? Oh, you know, whatever. Well, calling, you know, I turned around and he's standing behind me with a knife. So even if I had my cell phone in my hand, he wasn't going to let me dial 911. Right. If I had a gun, I'd say, hey, can you hold that thought? Let me go get my gun. What I'm creating is something that women will want to wear. Um, it's very versatile, I can't tell you unless you sign an NDA. But, um, <laughs> but it's something that really will revolutionize what's going on right now. And it 
it will bridge that gap between that split second moment where you need help. That is awesome. I mean, I think I'd probably want to wear something like that. I love that she's out there just like helping people with what she'd learned. I mean, she's really turned this around for herself and everybody. It's absolutely amazing. Oh, absolutely. Um, if anyone out there is in need of Kathleen's help, you can reach her on her website at www.safetychick.com or on Instagram at the safety chick. Thanks so much, Kathleen, for joining us in the studio today and telling your story. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out for help. You can find a list of resources on our Instagram, which is at Strictly Stalking Pod. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Strictly Stalking with Kathleen Gallagher. 